something just killed my dog. Something killed your dog? My dog went flying through the air over the tree. I don't know how it did it. Okay. Hello, my name is John Bindernagel. I'm a wildlife biologist and I've been studying the Sasquatch or Bigfoot for about 40 years and uh, today I'd just like to share some of uh, my results with you in uh, a three se segment presentation about 15 minutes each. This first segment is what the Sasquatch looks like, um, anatomical features in particular. Um, I, I like to start with a question, what is it that people see that makes them think they've seen a Sasquatch and not a bear on its hind legs or a human in a fur suit? Well, what they see and sometimes describe for us and sometimes draw for us is a huge, hair-covered, upright, human-shaped mammal. <clears throat> and this, this, of course, is very problematic because it is so human-like in its general appearance. But we should be aware that there are some anatomical details which are distinctly unhuman-like. And we can see from this drawing from, from Oregon from the 1970s, um, we do see the broad shoulders. But note also the long arms and that short, thick neck. And in this case, a tendency towards a, a somewhat pointed head. Now this raises a problem right at the outset. If, if, if you're like me, if you'd seen that, you'd come home, you, you'd look at, look, uh, go through field guide to the mammals, looking for a mammal that looks like this. And the closest image we'll find is a bear on its hind legs, which, which could be depicted this way, uh, both the front and side view. And of course, a bear on its hind legs has tapered shoulders, not these broad hominoid ape-like or human-like shoulders. And of course, from the side, the bear has a very prominent snout. Now, what's missing from our field guides still today is this image here of a Sasquatch. Front view, side view, and which really needs to be put on a facing page with an upright bear <clears throat> so that we can see that, aha, yes, the Sasquatch has a flat face, not the prominent snout of the bear. The Sasquatch has broad shoulders, which, although it makes it appear much more human-like, certainly makes it much less bear-like. Now let's look at a few more eyewitness drawings because I feel they're quite instructive. Here's one from New Mexico, 2002, relatively recent. Uh, Sasquatch walking bipedally, and this of course is, it's both a characteristic of the Sasquatch and a problem in that it walks bipedally, somewhat like a human, a different gait, but walk, walks bipedally. This one shows the, the long arms, short thick neck, and, and quite a pointed head. Another one from uh, Mineral Lake in Washington, 1991, shows the, the very, the, I think we're pretty much looking at adult males here in these, in these first images. Very broad shoulders, short thick neck, a very pointed head in this one. And then we'll move on to actually two more adult males. This one I quite like, it's from the Ottawa Valley of Ontario. Uh, short, thick neck. He's made a slight attempt to show facial features here. and He, he described the uh, nostrils as simply outward facing nostrils, two black holes in the face basically. Here's a very muscular appearing Sasquatch, according to the eyewitness drawing, from Ohio, 1980, which is kind of interesting because we do have these reports of beyond human strength and speed and this, this muscularity probably ties in with that. Now, not so much now, but a few years ago, if one mentioned Sasquatch, say from Ontario, or Canada, or from Ohio, eyebrows would be raised even more than usual because the Sasquatch used to be considered a mammal, if it existed, of the Pacific Northwest, the western states of um, the U.S. and, and Canada. So l let's look at this map, which shows the distribution of reports, although it's getting a bit old now, 2002 is when I made that map, but as we can see, most, the, the states and provinces with the most sightings are indeed in Western North America. British Columbia, Washington, Oregon, California, especially Northern California. And then the provinces and states just interior to these, and that would be Alberta, 
Idaho, and Montana. But there is this area of numerous reports, Ohio, Pennsylvania, even Maryland in, in the American Midwest and East, and if we accept the, 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 the swamp, swamp monkey or skunk ape of Florida as a Sasquatch, then we have to add Florida as well. Now, let's look at a couple more drawings because not all Sasquatches appear to be these great hulking wide-shouldered males. Some have been described as females, either on the basis of visible breasts, such as this one, or because it was carrying an infant, or appeared to be carrying an infant, such as this one. And of course, the, the controversial Patterson-Gimlin film, in good copies of that film, you can see that that appears to be a female with visible breasts. Yet other Sasquatches appear to be sub-adults or young adults. And these, of course, are, well, I'm say of course, and these are even more human-like th than, than, than the mature adults. They're more slender, more gangly in some places, not as broad-shouldered. Here's one from gee, only a couple hours from where I live here on Vancouver Island, observed by a, a deer hunter, two deer hunters, an older man who was my age, and a younger uh, fellow who was only 16 at the time. <clears throat> And there's a bit of a story behind this one because these two hunters are dragging a deer down a mountain and ahead they see this thing leaning against a tree and first they think it's Bob, the, the young uh, hunter's father. And they're thinking, what, what's Bob doing out here in torn rain gear or torn Stanfield underwear, whatever he's wearing? He's got better rain gear than that. And where's his rifle? It's November. Nobody's out here without a rifle um, these, in, at this time of year. Anyway, they decided they, they had to get that deer off the mountain, so they turned around, got the deer. By the time they came back to this place, uh, it was gone. But that evening, the young fellow made this drawing, and they basically concluded, gee, they, they must have seen a Sasquatch that day. So that's kind of interesting. Um, there's another uh, interesting sub-adult drawing, also from very near where I live, here uh, on Vancouver Island. <clears throat> And this is an interesting one because the girl who saw a teenage girl, there were two teenage girls on a Saturday morning on the beach uh, digging for something in, in, the, in, in the intertidal zone, and they heard a slapping on the water around the point. And they worked their way around and were confronted with this image, this being uh, uh, standing there with a stick in one hand and some ducks in the other. And just as they were turning to, to run, turn around and run, it turned and ran first, and they saw it run like a deer. And when, when the woman did the drawing for me, which I was very grateful for, I, I had to say, gee, gee whiz, that's, that looks very human-like. She said, well, it may look human-like in the drawing, but in no way was it a human. It was about seven feet tall, very muscular, covered with long, silky, reddish hair, ran like a deer. Uh, one more of these uh, would appear to be sub adults or young adults. This one again from Ohio, and this is actually a painting, uh, Ohio, 1982, a Sasquatch standing on a bridge. Uh, usual characteristics, the, the, the short neck, the tendency towards the pointed head, in this case sloping uh, from receding forehead, and uh, large hands as well as large feet. Now, we even have a pretty good idea of some, some of the uh, details of the Sasquatch face. We, we have a couple of uh, eyewitness drawings on for our use from Ohio. This one from near Sharon, Ohio. Interesting features because some of the characteristics are, are somewhat ape-like, and I'm referring now to the, to the thin lips, the wide mouth, the outward fa uh, forward-facing nostrils, and the very wide upper lip. And of course, this one also shows that very characteristic uh, short thick neck. A second one also from Ohio, uh, 1990, again similar, similar features, outward facing nostrils, thin lips, wide mouth, uh, tendon, very strong tendency towards the pointed head on that one and although it doesn't show up real well, a rounded chin, not, not the sharp pointed head of the human but the rounded chin of the some of the great apes. And one last one from Vancouver Island, just a sketch in this case, uh, looking at us, showing those forward-facing nostrils again. Now, just a last drawing. 
because every once in a while, well, not uh, a lot of these are, are, are quite good drawing, but sometimes we get uh, a Sasquatch observed by an exceptionally talented uh, artist, and that's what happened uh, on Mount Elphinstone in British Columbia in 2009 when uh, a young man observed this Sasquatch in an area where he was, uh, I believe he was tree planting. And it, it's a nice drawing. It shows that athletic ability and flexibility of the Sasquatch, which is so often described. Again, it's this kind of beyond human ability to climb trees, to run up a mountain quickly, or to squat down and disappear very quickly. And I think that's kind of captured in his drawing, which also seems to show that, that pointed head. So I'm going to break off there. That's uh, just kind of a review of what we what we think the Sasquatch looks like uh, based on, you know, what people have told us and, and showed us. And uh, then I'm going to move on into another form of evidence, and that, of course, is the, the tracks. Thank you. Hello. My name is John Bindernagel. I'm a, a wildlife biologist, and this is the second of three segments on uh, some of the results of my Sasquatch research over the last 40 years. The first one was about uh, the anatomical description of the Sasquatch itself. In the second one, I'm very keen to talk about Sasquatch tracks because as a biologist, when we see, well here, when we see bear tracks in the sand, we're ready to tick off bear as being present in the area. Unfortunately, we haven't reached the stage yet when we see a Sasquatch track in the sand or mud. Most of my biologists and scientific colleagues are, are unwilling to tick off Sasquatch in, in, in their field notes or whatever. So I, I want to talk about that, that problem. Now there, there are some problems with tracks and that's why we make these casts. Tracks can be quite difficult to photograph. This one actually turned out quite well. The human foot in there for scale is quite helpful. This one is quite good because the toes are kind of uh, curled and pointed downwards and there's the kind of nice round tip showing there in the mud and and here's almost the, well, the best situation uh, something loaned to me by, by Jeff Meldrum a, a very nice track which was subsequently cast and that's good because we have both the photograph of the track and the uh, track cast this is actually an interesting to start talking about because it shows a characteristic of uh, some Sasquatch tracks which as far as I know, do not occur in human beings, and that is the relatively straight line across the leading edge of the toes. It's been described often, drawn for us, almost never photographed, but here we see a pretty good depiction of it in, in a photograph and a cast. What's interesting about that feature is that that occurred in the first Sasquatch track ever cast, as far as we know. Now that original cast has been lost, but a tracing of it survives. And this is the tracing of it here, loaned to me by John Green. That was cast by a Washington State uh, Deputy Sheriff who uh, came up to BC, let me just check this, and photographed, uh, a, or sorry, the, and cast uh, a Sasquatch track in 1941. So this is pretty interesting. This is uh, our oldest track cast or track cast casing. Now an, another uh, feature of the Sasquatch foot, and this is something that Jeff Meldrum has talked about a lot in his research, is that the, is the thing about the mid-tarsal break. And it's shown here when you get some full-footed Sasquatch tracks and others which are referred to as half tracks. And the half tracks are different from a, a human on its toes because a human on its toes, it would only be about the front quarter or third of our, of our foot which, which would go into the soil, where the Sasquatch with the, the foot sort of breaking or flexing in, in the, near the midfoot, the, the, the half track is, is pretty close to half the full-size track. So that, that's an interesting feature about the Sasquatch foot, that, that different uh, flexing, different point of flexing. One quite consistent feature of Sasquatch tracks is that they tend to be broad compared to their length. Um, well, wide compared to their length, broader than the human foot or human tracks. This is a f quite an extreme example of it. It's a good example, but an extreme example from Pennsylvania, where the width of the foot behind the toes is fully 50% of its length. 
And similarly, in this rather small uh, Sasquatch track, only eight inches in length, the uh, width of the foot behind the toes is fully 50% of the length. Now, that is of interest, the broadness of the Sasquatch foot, for a couple of reasons. Well, for one, because it differs from the human foot, which tends to be narrower, e even when the human foot does get to be 16 inches long or something like that. Now, let, let's just look at a historical account here. Uh, back, it's from uh, Southwest Oregon, 1904, and, okay, some miners on the Sixes River had been observing wild, a, a wild man, as they called it, <clears throat> uh, in, in their area, and it was picked up by an editor of the Lane County Leader uh, from in Cottage Grove, Oregon. So, so the editor is writing, talking about the miners, when he says they. They say he, now he is the wild man, they say he is something after the fashion of a gorilla, and unlike anything else, either in appearance or action. Okay, so there we have a bit of physical description. A bit of behavior comes in here. He can throw rocks with wonderful force and accuracy. Now that's a very early report of this intimidation behavior that's commonly been reported for the Sasquatches. It certainly eliminates bears, could be human pranksters. Now this is kind of interesting. He is about seven feet high, has broad hands and feet, and his body is covered by a prolific growth of hair. Well here we have that reference to the total body covering of hair, the, the, the large size, seven feet, broad hands and feet. So they noticed broad feet already in 1904, and I find that quite interesting because uh, these men were ahead of it. You know, sometimes people ask, what did we know, or what do we know, and when did we know it? Well, we, we could have known about the broadness of the Sasquatch foot long ago. There's a couple other interesting aspects of the Sasquatch foot as recorded in track casts. For example, here's these uh, a pair of tracks from the Skeena River in northern British Columbia. Small round toes, which are at variance with other tracks such as two, well here's one that my wife and I cast, the one on the left, and uh, two other tracks that are deer hunter cast just north of here on Vancouver Island. Long toed tracks. And for years, people were puzzling about the short-toed Sasquatch and the long-toed Sasquatch. Well, f well, if there was so, such a thing. And then came the track cast, 1982, came to our attention from Grays Harbor County, Washington, a wonderful cast in which the toes are held in a very tightly curled position, showing us that, yes, the toes are long, but sometimes they're held like this so that only the toe tips register in the soil, giving the appearance of short-toed tracks. Now, anyone interested in tracks and tracking knows that we don't we can't just rely on individual tracks, but that the pattern of the tracks, the trackway, or what uh, the technical term is trail, in a very specific sense of the word trail, a trail of tracks shows us a great deal about the animal. For example, here is a trail of uh, grizzly bear tracks on a road. And first of all, there's both hind foot and forefoot. Second, there is this straddle or width to the trail. And here's a human trail in snow. And it's kind of interesting because we humans, when we walk, also show a certain amount of straddle or trail width. And in addition, when the snow is a little bit deep, we tend to do this scuffing uh, where our, our, our heel slides in and our toe drags out. Now let's look at the Sasquatch trail. Here's one where the animal, the, the animal, the mammal, is walking towards us. And note the linearity, the, the lack of straddle. We can't tell from the scale, Hubert, these are large tracks with a fairly large uh, stride interval. The lack of scuffing in the, in the relatively deep snow. And here's another one from Ohio, again. And this, is, this has been mentioned by people in the past. I, I remember someone saying, it's as if the Sasquatch was walking on a tightrope. That's how, that's how in line the tracks were. And we get a sense here of scale from, from the, the, the person who's partly in the photograph that this is a very long stride length. And uh, one more here, uh, this one from uh, Arizona. Again, only three tracks, but quite well lined up. Now, 
there's an obvious question here. If this track evidence is as good as some of us think it is, why have we not moved ahead and, you know, gone with this really good evidence and uh, attracted the attention of our scientific colleagues and managed to get the, the, the Sasquatch being studied in mainstream universities, government uh, conservation agencies? Well, there's been a distraction, and that is the distraction of hoaxes. And we should talk about hoax because it, it turns out to have been a very important inhibiting factor to Sasquatch research. Here we have a man showing two carved wooden Sasquatch feet, <clears throat> presumably made by his uncle, um, Mr. Wallace, uh, yeah, uh, some years ago. And, in, and he ca this came out in 2002 as an explanation for Sasquatch tracks. And the media loved it. They jumped on this and said, great, case closed. And, you know, we had headlines, a lot of different headlines. One of them was, originator of Bigfoot hoax dies, family fesses up. Another one, footprints big, but 42-year Bigfoot hoax even larger. Well, there's a couple of interesting things. One of the interesting things is this second one, 42-year Bigfoot hoax. Where on earth did they come up with 42 years? Because We've already talked about a 1904 report describing the feet. We have other reports from the 1850s, 1870s, 1880s. Good reports, good descriptions. Well, what they were referring to <clears throat> was this newspaper article, 1958, which is close to 42 years. I'm sure this is what they were referring to. New Sasquatch found, it's called Bigfoot. This was Jerry Crew, the... the construction person in Northern California who kind of, um, mm, the Sasquatch became quite popular as a subject of newspaper and media inquiry around that time. And at, unfortunately this is also the time when the Sasquatch was given the, what I call the unfortunate nickname Bigfoot. But uh, which, which, which is problematic because, I mean, it's very hard, I think, for, for a scientist to take seriously an animal with the nickname Bigfoot, so, which is why so many of us serious investigators like to stick with the uh, word Sasquatch, which is derived from an Aboriginal name. There, there was, uh, anyway, so, but let's look more closely at the evidence brought forward for the Sasquatch as a hoax. Here we have Dale Wallace holding his, the, these fabricated, uh, wooden feet. Look at the toes more closely. The toes are square. The, the hoaxer hadn't even bothered to round off the toes. Let's look at another uh, one, of, one of these fabricated foot examples. This is from 1982. Um, Rant Mullins brought forward some carved wooden Sasquatch feet. And once again, what we see here, the heel is square. He hasn't even bothered to round off the heel more than just a little bit. So the question is, well, there's a couple questions here. <laughs> Sasquatch, oh, sorry, scientists who are not stupid have accepted the hoax hypothesis. They, they, they regularly explain and tell me that you, you, you should know that the, 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 the hoaxes explain Sasquatches. Well, no, no. Hoaxes do not explain Sasquatch track, at least not, not according to the evidence that's been, been brought forward and that which, which was so widely accepted in 2002. Now, um, two quotes here, if I may, before closing. One being, one of the first, uh, this, is, this is interesting, this is from uh, historian Carl Becker. One of the first duties of man is not to be duped to be aware of his world. Well, I, I say this because I, it raises the question, who is being duped by these claims of these carved wooden feet explaining all the Sasquatch tracks that have been seen before and since and have been cast as evidence? So I think that's kind of interesting because it looks at things a little different way. And, and speaking of evidence, a very good uh, a very good quote from philosopher of science Michael Polanyi on the subject of facts and evidence. And he was talking about two different uh, scientific discoveries that were being treated as controversial. And he said, but looking at these disputes more closely, it appears that the two sides do not accept the same facts as facts and still less the same evidence as evidence. 
So there we are. This happens, you know, with, with mainstream scientists involved in laboratory research, and it certainly has happened with Sasquatch research to the point, to the point of the Sasquatch having been treated as scientifically taboo, a scientifically taboo subject, which has been very, well, not only distressing, but it's been very inhibiting as far as trying, trying to move ahead. So uh, I just want to leave that some of those thoughts on tracks for now, and we'll go on to one more segment. Thank you. Hello, my name is John Bindernagel. I'm a wildlife biologist, and uh, this is the third segment in a series of three on the Sasquatch and on the unfolding discovery of the Sasquatch. And I alluded in the, at the end of the last section about some of the things that have inhibited serious Sasquatch research. And I want, to, uh, I want to expand on that because I think it's quite important. And to me, the question for some time now has not been, does the Sasquatch exist or not? We know the Sasquatch does exist. The question is, why has the Sasquatch been treated as a scientifically taboo subject? Why is it not a subject of mainstream scientific research? Let's start with uh, one of my scientific heroes, E.O. Wilson of Harvard, who in his book Consilience wrote a very interesting paragraph about evidence and discovery. He said, he wrote, as evidence piles upon evidence, certain bodies of knowledge do gain universal acceptance. They ascend a scale of credibility from interesting to suggestive to persuasive and finally compelling and, given enough time, obvious. Well, I put uh, E.O. Wilson's categories on, uh, on a scale, uh, which is the way I think he means that many bodies of evidence do lead to a tipping point where the results finally, after it being uh, interesting, suggestive, persuasive, compelling, and he says finally obvious, or I might say conclusive. No, but there's a problem because I don't think he's had to deal with the Sasquatch as an unfolding discovery. If he had, he would realize that in the case of the Sasquatch, there was a category below evidence being interesting, and that is that the evidence is unreasonable, irrelevant, or baseless. And that's what we seem to have happened here. And when that happens, <clears throat> there is a blockage. Uh, the evidence is more or less banned from moving up the scale to be found interesting, suggestive, persuasive, compelling, or eventually obvious. And what is this evidence? Well, we haven't talked about it here, but there's the aboriginal evidence of early Americans and First Nations people who've been describing the Sasquatch to us for many years, to put it mildly, but which we have kind of misinterpreted uh, when we interpret myth and legend too narrowly as referring to a supernatural being or a fictional being. Then there's the historical reports, such as we mentioned a little earlier, like the, the 1904 report from Oregon, where uh, miners actually described in a published newspaper account um, aspects of Sasquatch anatomy behavior. Then there are, you know, that might have been suggestive, persuasive, could have been the eyewitness descriptions, eyewitness drawings, and say, my goodness, there's this remarkable consistency in what people from New Mexico see, and Ontario see, and British Columbia see. And then there's evidence which some people have found to be compelling, and that could be the Patterson-Gimlin film, which many of us do find compelling. And then finally, for some of us who are involved with tracks, I would suggest what we find, I won't say obvious, but conclusive, is, is, are the tracks, which reveals the Sasquatch as a track-leaving mammal, and which could have brought us to the tipping point before now. So what is the evidence that's missing? Well, obviously, a cadaver of this lower, a figure in the lower right here. A cadaver would be, would change things overnight. Possibly DNA would do the same thing. And I think we would move with very conclusive evidence along those lines, especially a cadaver, immediately up to the tipping point of acceptance. Then what would happen? Then there would be these questions, and the public would be say, asking, my goodness, why do scientists appear to be surprised that the Sasquatch actually exists? 
Did they not see it coming? Was there, <laughs> I'm being a little bit facetious here, was there no scientific dialogue leading up to this? Well, we have tried to engage uh, our scientific colleagues in some dialogue leading up, up to us, trying to bring some of this other evidence to, to their attention for their sake, uh, because sooner or later we're going to have to deal with it. I think we're now going to, at some point, we're going to find ourselves having to go back and saying, oh my goodness, as long ago as 1904, the broadness of the Sasquatch foot was described. Oh my goodness, some of these eyewitness drawings are really quite good. They're very close to the actual cadaver, the actual type specimen we, we may have at some point. You know, that film, people always said it looked like a real animal, a real creature, not, 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 not a human in a fursuit, but a real animal in its own skin, <laughs> not in a costume. Anyway, um, so that's kind of an interesting philosophical uh, take on it. Now. Uh, some of my colleagues say they're skeptical, and, and that's fine. And others, more and more, are, are, are saying that they're agnostic. And, and I think the difference is kind of significant. A skeptic, according to the dictionary, denies or questions the validity of a stance or position and is doubtful regarding its validity. Okay, that, that's skepticism. An agnostic is unwilling to commit to an opinion about a subject. And this is kind of interesting because this is, these, these are the people who say, I don't know. I don't have enough information. I haven't really studied it, so I, I, I'm not in a position to say yes or no. Now, astronomer Carl Sagan, uh, towards the end of his career, became a science commentator, a real, almost a philosopher of science, and he was very strong about skepticism. He said, you know, we must be skeptical. But he cautions us about if we're being too skeptical by saying, but <clears throat> if you're only skeptical, then no idea makes it through to you. Every now and then, a new idea turns out to be on the mark, valid and wonderful. If you're only skeptical, you're going to miss the transforming discoveries in science, and this is strong, and you will be obstructing understanding and progress. That's, that's pretty strong language, and uh, it comes from a man who, who really boosts skepticism. So I, I found that pretty interesting, coming from Carl Sagan. Now, when I do these presentations, and I, which I've been doing for, for about 20 years now, and, and sometimes to scientific colleagues, more often to scientifically minded people, I'm always trying to figure out where these folks are, what, what have they heard about the Sasquatch, and what do they think of it. And I, I always think that roughly half a room full of people is skeptical, and the other half, more and more, is agnostic. I also realize, and I find this especially at universities, there is a, maybe not a small segment, maybe a large segment, that's strongly opposed to this whole idea. They find it preposterous. Some are even hostile. They're embarrassed that a person who can, calls himself a scientist with a PhD is, is taking this on and treating it, treating the Sasquatch as an existing North American mammal. They just find that, as I say, preposterous. Then, Again, again, this is this is a kind of evolving situation. Some people say, "Gee," and 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 they they, they, they we get they, they look at us as believers, and that that's that's a media thing. The media likes to call us believers, or even worse, true believers. And I like to say, "No, no, we're, we're not believers. There's no faith involved. We are convinced by the evidence." But anyway, there are these people who say, "Wow." You, you folks that have been studying this, you investigators, and are convinced, you're, you're ahead of the curve, aren't you? Well, not so fast. Thanks, but not so fast. Because for every person who thinks we're ahead of the curve, there's about 100 people that think we're delusional. And, haha, that's kind of, a, kind of a joke, but not completely a joke. Because there is so much evidence to support th this feeling, this, this, this conclusion that we are delusional. For example, a book that came out in 2008, published by the prestigious University of California Press, titled Anatomy of a Beast, Obsession and Myth on the Trail of Bigfoot. And the author writes, if people can delude themselves into believing in the existence of an eight-foot-tall ape man, what on earth might they be thinking about truly important matters? Well, this is obviously a... Uh, rhetorical question, but it's very strongly put. 
Another book also came out in 2008, and this is by Joshua Buse. Again, a prestigious university press, University of Chicago Press. His title, Bigfoot, Life and Times of a Legend. And Buse went to great pains to criticize and even ridicule the way Sasquatch research has been handled over the years. And this is kind of a touchy subject because scientists have just avoided the subject completely, so it's been taken over by uh, amateur investigators, many of whom are very dedicated and, and, and very disciplined, others less so. But anyway, he, he does this job of ridiculing Sasquatch research and, and the conclusion that the Sasquatch is an extant or existing North American mammal. So he, he got this review in Publishers Weekly by a reviewer who was uh, quite impressed with Bue's take on Sasquatch research. Bues is at his amused best when following the exploit, exploits of Bigfoot's handlers, the colorful band of true believers, hoaxers, and pseudo-documentarists who constructed this greatest of shaggy dog stories. Well, you can see that he's done a very good job of debunking the Sasquatch research as a serious activity, which, which was apparently his intent, and certainly worked with this, with this, with this reviewer. Because, you know, we are referred to as true believers, we're lumped with hoaxers, so casting tracks like this is not, document, not, not documentation of uh, scientific evidence, but it makes us pseudo-documentarists. So anyway, it, it, it's, it's difficult when this, this view is being promoted so strongly and being widely accepted, uh, it being, 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 you know, published by scientific presses. Okay, now, I don't want to get too uh, deep here on this idea of truth, but there's a, a nice quote from Sam and Rushdie in, in, in a piece of his writing called Facting, Finding Truth in Fact and Fiction. And he says, fine as the word truth sounds, truth is all too often unpalatable, awkward, unorthodox. The armies of received ideas are marshaled against it, yet it must, if at all possible, be told. Well, here, here you have it, you see. A few scientists, uh, like myself and a handful of others that have come before me and, and work alongside now, we are trying to tell this to bring our scientific colleagues online, to um, solicit their help because some of them are quite well funded and certainly more knowledgeable than some of the, some of the rest of us are. So one works at this and of course one is trying to uh, vindicate those amateur investigators and those eyewitnesses who've been willing to come forward saying this is what I saw, I made a drawing, here's the track I found, I have photographs and here's a cast and they're actually against a lot of social uh, ridicule coming forward. So, uh, yes, that's the, uh, that's the end of that presentation, and I hope some of that uh, is helpful, because I think it's quite important. Thank you.